Okay, did it reach you all? Fantastic, yes. Awesome. So Matt, many thanks for introducing us. And we want to thank also the organizing committee for um, yeah, making this happen, actually. It's a wonderful um, chance and opportunity to give this educational talk to me and Andre, which is about how to get and how to use para hydrogen. So let me maybe quickly get the laser pointer. First of all, when we consider the um, hydrogen atom, we, we basically have a spin half particle, which can have two distinct energy eigenstates in magnetic field, which are often referred to like the spin up state and the spins down state. And um, it's organized um, or aligned in this matter, um, actually for all nuclei with spin half and geomagnetic ratio larger than um, zero. So with um, a geomagnetic ratio smaller than zero, it would just be the opposite way around. Anyway, for this um, single proton would have this kind of alignment. So similar, if we now consider the hydrogen molecule, which consists of two protons, so two um, hydrogen atoms, we find four energy states. And that's basically because of the addition of angular momentum, which can basically give us I um, equal to two to one or I equal to zero. And um, similarly, we find for this I equal to one state, three azimuthal projections, um, which are like one, zero and minus one. Uh, meaning that here in this I equal to one state, we have a triplet, basically three states, um, which are possible, three eigenstates. And for the I equal to zero state, we have M equal to zero and find this state that we are actually interested in today because this is the parahydrogen state. And the big difference between these um, states, so let's say this one and this triplet state up here, is that the parahydrogen basically is anti-symmetric um, under exchange of the two protons, meaning basically when I'm exchanging um, the, the first and the second arrow here on both sides, this would just be the same wave function, but with a different sign. So I would have a minus in front of it, which is not the case for the three um, triplet states up here, which would just be like under exchange being the same function. So these are the symmetric states. Um, I quickly want to note that there are other notations frequently used. For example, for this spin up, we also refer um, to it as alpha. And for the spin down state, we often refer to beta. And for the triplet states, often called um, T plus for the one one state, T zero and T minus. And the singlet state is often referred to as the S state. So we have the question how to get this parahydrogen state enriched. And that is basically um, just a quantum mechanical phenomenon that we are using here because the hydrogen molecule H2 consists of protons and electrons. So all involved um, particles would be spin half particles. And therefore um, the hydrogen molecule follows the Fermi direct statistics, um, meaning that according to Pauli principle, under exchange of the two protons, the total wave function has to change its sign. So it has to be anti-symmetric. So again, the total wave function um, explaining all degrees of freedom of this molecule. So which degrees of freedom do we have? We basically have translational and vibrational as well as electronic uh, wave functions, um, which, have, which are symmetric. So they are just symmetric, meaning that basically this um, situation can be simplified. And we are finding that the product of the rotational and the nuclear spin wave function has to be anti-symmetric. Um, therefore, as we have just seen under exchange of the protons, the parahydrogen is anti-symmetric, um, meaning that it has to pair with symmetrical rotational wave functions and vice versa, para and autohydrogen pairs with anti-symmetric rotational um, wave functions. And um, because the, the nuclear energies and, and the splittings are relatively small and many orders of magnitude smaller than the rotational state, we find in the end that actually the rotational state determines the energetic ground state. So um, meaning that the, basically the symmetrical rotational wave function, which um, belongs to J equal to zero is the lowest energy state. And uh, J1 would have a higher energy, then comes J2 and so on. And this again brings us to the point that para hydrogen, which pairs with this J0 to all the um, even J numbers is after all um, the lowest energy state. This I will quickly show you in this little diagram here, where you can see again all the rotational energy and all the rotational eigenstates, basically the um, even states here on the left, which would pair with the anti-symmetric parahydrogen, 
and all the odd states on the right, one, three, five, and so on, which pair with the auto hydrogen. And it's just shown here that these energy gaps are relatively large. So of the order of several Kelvin, if you um, put this into Kelvin scale, and um, therefore, um, basically at low temperatures, mostly this J0 state would be populated in the um, thermal equilibrium and only at higher temperatures, you would kind of get a balance. And this I'm showing you here, like on a graph where I'm plotting auto hydrogen and power hydrogen fractions in percent as function of the temperature. And just as I have just mentioned, um, at very high temperatures or like here, even at room temperature, we have an almost equal um, population of all four states, meaning that the three states of auto hydrogen sum up to 75% hyper auto hydrogen fraction and the para hydrogen state has um, probability of 25%. Now, if we are changing temperature, so we are going to very low temperatures, we see that slowly the para hydrogen state gets the most favorable one. So in an equilibrated um, sample, we basically could enrich para hydrogen at low temperatures to yeah, 100% almost. However, um, because of this symmetry considerations that we've just um, actually looked at, um, the, the auto and para transitions are symmetry forbidden. So they can't just happen by themselves because the molecule would um, inquire, like need a change of the nuclear wave function in symmetry and also of the rotational wave function. Therefore, what people would typically do is introducing um, like a second strong dipolar magnetic dipole moment just to, to catalyze these um, transitions. So the basic idea is then that you go to low temperatures that can be technically achieved. For example, 77 Kelvin, which is just approximately the um, nitrogen boiling point where we already have para hydrogen enrichment of approximately 50%. And at even lower temperatures, the hydrogen molecule boiling point, um, which is at 20 Kelvin, we reach almost our 100% that we actually want to have with 99.8%. And at these temperatures, the, um, the hydrogen would get in touch um, or pass a catalyst, um, for example, iron oxide, just to induce these transitions. So we now quickly want to show you some of the, the setups um, that have been published. So just some examples. And as I've just mentioned, um, one option is to go to liquid nitrogen temperatures, the order of 77 Kelvin. And um, there is one setup published by, I hope pronounced it correctly, Jong at, and co-workers, um, where they, they have a big dewer here, which is nicely isolated from the, from the outside and the inside they fill liquid nitrogen. Then here on the left in the schematic, you can see that normal hydrogen gas would basically be introduced into this chamber. It comes in with this thermal equilibrium. So at room temperature um, populations of 75% auto hydrogen and 25% para hydrogen. And then when it's passing this um, low temperatures and gets in touch with um, iron hydroxide here as the catalyst, we would basically in the end, end up with this equilibrated um, fraction of 50% para hydrogen, which can then be used for experiments. A very similar setup here is shown by Alexei Kiritin and um, co-workers. Basically, this is installed in a bigger setup, which directly is used for experiments. Andre will show you this part later. Um, the para hydrogen converter is shown here, and it's the same procedure. Para normal hydrogen gas gets in, crosses this U-tube, which is placed in liquid nitrogen and is filled with activated charcoal. And so in the end, we have this para hydrogen enriched and can then use it for experiments or store it in um, a container for the para hydrogen. So the advantage of this setups at liquid nitrogen is that they are relatively cheap because liquid nitrogen is cheap and also a dual is not like that much of cost. So um, this is a very convenient way of getting some enrichment and performing experiments. However, if you want to, to push everything out that you can, you basically would go to even lower temperatures as we have seen in this plot, which is shown you also on the top um, upper right, um, basically here close to 20 Kelvin, where you have this um, equilibrium um, population of almost 100% para hydrogen. But the idea is very similar. So basically we start with molecular hydrogen, just room temperature hydrogen, with 25% um, para hydrogen fraction. 
enter these into this, this cryo cooler over here, um, which is based on, on helium compressor and um, expander to cool it down to 20 Kelvin. It would get in, in contact with this, this catalyst, basically iron oxide or activated charcoal. And once you're leaving the chamber again, you end up with your high enrichment. Experimentally demonstrated was 98% um, here. Like a very similar setup that is shown here, um, basically follows the same idea, also using this um, helium cryo cooler. Basically, um, here there was a special requirement because this setup is installed in the clinic, so some of the parts had to be inside the building, all the electronics, but all explosive parts were installed on the outside of the building. This is shown here schematically. This wall separates the outside and the inside part. And um, yeah, all this left thing actually just cools this cooling finger down to this 20 Kelvin temperature. Then hydrogen would be delivered through this chamber, cool down a little bit at this very low temperature crosses or passes the catalyst chamber. And once it's leaving um, the system again, we end up with a high fraction of 98% para hydrogen which can then be filled into gas bottles and can be used for experiments. Um, I just quickly want to draw your attention that this has, um, is also commercially available since quite a time. There's this Bruca system, which operates at 36 Kelvin, delivers approximately 90% para hydrogen up to nine bars. Um, it's a steady flow system and requires no water cooling and some more advanced system by advanced research systems, um, basically, just um, is very similar to the setups I've shown you before. These two helium cryo cooling setups operates at approximately 20 Kelvin and reaches up to 99% para hydrogen at an incredibly high pressure of 50 bars, which you can then use to explode your samples. It's really nice um, setup actually. And um, yeah, it's commercially available. So if you haven't installed one, you may consider that. So the last question I would like to answer before handing over to Andre is how long can I store and use my, my para hydrogen once it's enriched? And just like to give you the idea, even though the transitions uh, between para and auto hydrogen are forbidden, still when we have our high hydrogen, um, para hydrogen fraction and place it in, in at room temperature, it would slowly equilibrate back to the room temperature fraction of 25%, um, basically because there are always some kind of impurities, there's always some momentum or um, yeah, you just have something that can catalyze the, the transitions. However, how long you can use it basically absolutely depends on how you're storing it. And people have shown incredibly long lifetimes of 100 days and a um, little bit more when you're having um, it filled into aluminum tanks, for example, aluminum cylinders uh, without any paramagnetic impurities. However, once you're introducing oxygen, for example, with this um, slightly paramagnetic um, you, you can catalyze these transitions already, and Sean Wagner has shown that this can lead to a much shorter lifetime. Once in the, the parahydrogen enters the solution, we still know that the, the lifetime is still of the order of minutes, and even in presence of catalysts, seconds to minutes have been shown. So there is enough time to actually run very nice experiments and making yeah, cool hyperpolarization out of the sample to enhance things. And how to do this, how to use it, Andre is showing you next. I am handing over. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas, for producing the hydrogen for us. <laughs> um, You're welcome. I'm wondering. Hmm. I cannot share my screen one second. Okay, I just cannot choose. Uh... Do you see now my screen? Sorry, the PowerPoint presentation. We do, yes. That's yes. perfect. Thank you. Yeah, thank you a lot. And uh, thank you, Andreas, for introducing us to how to produce power hydrogen. And thank you for 
introduction. So I'll continue with application. So basically, we, every one of us has different goals, how we want to use bar hydrogen. So for biochemical chem applications, for industrial analysis, and maybe even for future medical diagnostics. But all of us use bar hydrogen, most, uh, I think, 99% of us, for, to increase or boost the signal of MRI or NMR. So we use two techniques in many cases. It's bar hydrogen induced polarization or FIP and signal amplification by reversible exchange, known Sabre. I will slowly introduce you to these techniques and how we actually can use bar hydrogen. So FIP is a hydrogenating bar hydrogen technique. For FIP, you need uh, three components in many cases. It's bar hydrogen itself, it's a substrate with unstrated double triple bond and appropriate catalyst. So in this, uh, in this case, in these conditions, um, Par hydrogen can uh, bind to this unsaturated uh, tri triple bond, and then the product will be hyperpolarized. So because par hydrogen itself had um, highly ordered spin alignment, then the product as well will have the same spin alignment. But very important is the reaction must be pay-wise hydrogenation. And I think I have to tell a few words about this right now. So. Imagine have a hypothetical situation that we produce H2 in the T plus state. It's a very simple state and both nuclei in alpha alpha spin state. And then some catalysts, they actually split hydrogen on single atoms like H A and B. And they, these atoms randomly uh, working in the surface or in the solution. And then sometimes they assemble back to H2 or they react one by one with the uh, precursor. So the, after assembling, the state will be the same T plus or alpha alpha spin state. And in this case, as you see, the state at the beginning and the end is actually the same. So if you would use or can produce T plus state in any way, then in this case, it's not important or uh, is direction is pairwise or not. But unfortunately, or fortunately, in some cases, we use actually H2, a uh, uh, bar hydrogen, our hydrogen state, which is singlet spin order, and given by this wave function. And if H2 will be split by this catalyst, then H both atoms will be in alpha or beta state with equal probability. And if then we assemble back the uh, hydrogen from the random atoms, or they will hydrogenate the product one by one, then, then, then H2 will be in this state. So every spin state are equally populated and no any polarization available. That's why we lost all spin alignment what was before. That's why for FIP and for Sabre as well, it's very important to have pairwise hydrogenation that H2 never splits on single atoms. So I, I said before that we need catalysts and there are different uh, catalytic hydrogenation uh, reactions and maybe uh, methods. So one is homogeneous catalysis, is then we use substrate and the catalyst in the, in the liquid phase, so everything is well dissolved in the proper solvent, including H2. And then in, if you use homogeneous catalyst, you always have almost every, every time have pyrewise hydrogenation. It provides usually the highest achievable polarization for the substrate. We can make one step to the um, direction of heterogeneous catalysis. So in this case, we take basically the same homogeneous catalyst, but then link them to silicon particles. This is called uh, immobilized catalyst. In this case, this, the formula is for immobilized Wilkinson catalyst. Surprisingly, the, it was shown that pairwise hydrogenation is occurring here in the same level so it's close to 100%, but the polarization level decreases. The reason is that faster relaxation rate in this complex and slower reaction sometimes, or slower reaction of hydrogenation. And then the final step to maybe industrial application or large scale application would be the metal surfaces like doped uh, with palladium titanium oxide here. So this is heterogeneous catalyst, which can be easily used, easily filter it from the solvent, from hyperpolarized media, but unfortunately, it has very low pairwise hydrogenation, so which is improved with time right now. 
in the group of Novosibirsk and some other people. So, and here I just schematically show that polarization level actually decreases if you go from homogeneous to heterogeneous catalyst, but it has the benefits like bio, uh, bio compatible hyperpolarized media can be provided with heterogeneous catalyst much simpler. So now we switch to Sabre. Sabre is single amplification by reversible exchange. And here on the right side, you can see the most commonly used Iridium IMS uh, Sabre complex, which was already activated in the presence of hydrogen and pyridine. So pyridine is used here as a substrate. So pyridine uh, coordinate to three, uh, to three sides of Iridium and H2 on the other side. So this plane we would call equatorial plane of, of the catalyst and Iridium. So it's an amplification by reversible exchange. And what's exchanging here is a substrate basically exchanges according to SN1 mechanism with active complex and hydrogen as well exchanges with, with it. And because we use power hydrogen, then these two hydride protons, the um, um, single state of them is overpopulated at the beginning. And in some condition, which I think will be dis discussed today in, in some other talks, the polarization can be transferred from this state to, for example, T plus beta state. And as you see, the alpha state of the substrate will be underpopulated because we transfer it from this state and beta state will be overpopulated. So we create, in this sense, underpopulated alpha and overpopulated beta state of the substrate. So in this sense, without any modification of substrate, we, one can polarize substrate, which will then, after polarization, can go away from the complex. So we know, in principle, now we can, how we can produce and how to use, but actually how we can, one can deliver efficiently the power hydrogen to the reaction chamber. The very first and simple uh, method is fill and shake. So you take many, uh, one of many available commercially uh, nematubes with valves and fill it with the sample, so with catalyst and substrate, close the tube, and then you connect to this valve um, any power hydrogen line. So for example, here it can be one of a 16 inch uh, PTFE tube connected, or for example, here it can be silicon tube, four millimeter connected. And then you just pressurize the tube. So the, in the top will be pH two. Then you disconnect the line and vigorously shake your, shake your NMR tube. And then the power hydrogen will be dissolved in the, in the solvent below and the reaction will start. The other method would be utilization of automatic uh, utilization of electromagnetic wells. Wells. So in this system, it, will, it, it has three electromagnetic wells, which can be controlled with uh, logic, like TTL pulses. And so it works in the following way: you connect here power hydrogen cylinder or reactor reaction chamber, sorry, power hydrogen generator, and then if you send a command here with using your machine, whatever you use, Brooker or SpinSolve. You can open this valve and then the hydrogen will flow via Teflon tube to NMR sample. And the bubbling will start. And this way you control the bubbling delivery to the system. So if you close this valve, then unfortunately the, reaction, the bubbling doesn't stop because you still have here a lot of hydrogen in the, in the line. And what you do, you open the other valve, it's TTL3 in this scheme, and then all this hydrogen goes away via the, uh, very thick, um, in the, uh, thick pipe in exhaust. But still, at the same time, hydrogen, although it's not bubbling, but it's still dissolved in the system. And if you want to stop the reaction for some reason, you can just immediately flush at the same time with nitrogen or argon, and then remove the um, dissolved hydrogen from the sample. So this system operates at one bar. So because it uses one bar over pressure here, so atmospheric pressure. And if you want to go for high fields, then you need to modify the system a little, but it's not much modification. And you can see how it can be nicely done in this work, for example. 
So now we know how, what experiments we can do and how we can deliver a bar hydrogen. And in general, we divide all experiments on two sections, like in situ, it's then hydrogenation and hyperization and observation happening in the same place. So it means like you bubble and at the inside of NMR or MRI spectrometer. And then if you don't apply anything like uh, RF pulses extra to transfer polarization, then this experiment would sometimes be referred as spontaneous transfer of polarization. But if you then use some RF pulses to and aim to transfer polarization somewhere else, then it will be like induced polarization transfer. And there are many different experiments in these and these sections. Andre, we should be entering the question period soon. So if you ah, yeah. Thank you. Sorry. So I wanted to say a few examples as well, but then I have to say that you have to del uh, produce power hydrogen, then transfer, and then control all parameters of the re in the reaction chamber, like pressure, temperature, solvent, and pH value, to get a very high level of polarization. Thank you. Thank you very much to both speakers. I, I have a couple questions that came in. Uh, the first question is, is there a boiling point issue when preparing power hydrogen at sub 20 Kelvin? Does hydrogen freeze at these temperatures? Indeed it does. Um, I'm at 100% sure. I guess it's around like 15 K or so. So it can easily happen that you, you freeze your system. Uh, in particular, also because you would like to apply higher pressures, right? So you're even um, increasing the, the freezing point slightly. So your system may just get stuck when you cool to, to very low temperatures. But as said, as this, um, at this 20 Kelvin, you already have like a theoretical maximum of close to 100%. So it's just a good um, temperature to work at. And the uh, next question has come in is, what are the essential catalyst features ensuring the pairwise addition of parahydrogen. How much does the polarization drop in going from homogeneous to heterogeneous catalysts? Uh, maybe it's a question to me. So it can drop like 10, 10 times or even more. Depend. So the first heterogeneous catalyst were, I think, not super efficient, but then now we're reaching to 1% or so of polarization in heterogeneous cases. Mm -hmm. So which is only about 10 times smaller than maximum available for homogeneous catalysts. Let's see. Are there any questions? So anyone who has a question and wants to ask it themselves, please uh, click in the, in the participants window and, and raise your hand. Um, otherwise, message me. Uh, 